Hello and welcome to my little trip down road testing memory lane. Uh, today's a Q&A video, so thanks very much for sending all your questions in. There's loads of them and I will get to them all. Um, but today I've picked out 11 crackers to go through. So without further ado, let's start with left hand thread 5897. Thank you for your question. I'm an intermediate track day rider on a 675. My right hand corners are really coming along now. Good body position and knee always planted, but my lefts are awful. I feel unnatural and don't get my knee down and I just feel tense. Is this normal? Is there a cure? Love the vids, keep them coming. Thank you very much. Well, um, yes, it is normal and it, there is a cure and it's down to body position. I would bet my house on the fact that your body position is different on the left to what it is on the right um because you're not feeling comfortable on the lefts and you know we've all got our favorite side left or right for whatever reason maybe in the uk it might be down to the fact that roundabouts because we drive on the left go around to the right so you practice rights more than left um and on race tracks most UK tracks, I think all of them, um, since Rockingham went, Rockingham International, uh, clockwise, they all go right. So you don't really get to practice around lefts very often. And that could be different elsewhere in the world where you drive on the right and you've got left hand roundabouts. And a lot of the tracks, like in Spain and around the world, uh, are left-handed in Australia. Um, but who knows the reason? But the... The, the reason you'd struggle on one side more than the other is because you've got a different body position. So, and I would say that it's because of your arm position. So if you uh, were managed to find any pictures of you riding around the track, you might be able to study your body position a little bit more in detail. But um, when you're going around right-handers and you're feeling comfortable, I reckon that you've got your arm bent, which is what you should be doing. And around lefts, where you're not feeling comfortable, I think you've got your arms straight. And when you've got your arms straight, it's hard to get into the body position. The bike doesn't flow around the corner like you'd like it to. And it's kind of a bit of a downward spiral because the more uncomfortable you feel around lefts, the more tense you'll be and the more likely you are to, to bend your, to not bend your, your inside arm. So, you know, there's a very easy cure and that's, that's to bend your arm. But that's easier said than done, really. So the way, the way to get there is to, to lean forward on the bike and that will help you, you bend your arm. So <clears throat> on a racetrack, you should be riding like a jockey the whole time. You know, as low as you can on the, on the fuel tank until it's time to brake. That's the only real time you're going to be sitting up is under braking. And once you let go of the brakes, then you, you're back on the tank again to the point where you can kind of feel the, the tank on your chest. And that's what's going to give you your inside arm. If you lean right over the front, you can't, you can't bend, you can't keep your arm straight. So it's a question of when you finish braking is to kind of collapse your body and bend your inside arm. Now, obviously there's lots of other things to do on the track as to the rest of your body position. But I think if you just did that alone and just stayed static in the seat and rode like Charlie Chaplin with your feet, you'd get round corners a little bit better. But if you can get your foot position right, so the inside peg, you've got your, the ball of your foot on the inside peg, you've got one bum cheek hanging off to the left, and you've got your head and shoulders off to the, the side of the bike, in this case, the left side. So you've got your head to the left of the fairing or your head down where the mirror is. And in your mind's eye, you want to think about, even though you're not going to do this, have your chin on your, your hand. So when you're going through the corner, <clears throat> you've got your elbow nicely bent. And really, obviously you're not getting your elbow down, but if you point your elbow down towards the apex, you know, and think, pretend you're going to kind of elbow the apex as you go round, then, then you're going to get in a really good body, body position and you're going to feel a lot more comfortable around lefts. So um, yeah, really work on that. You can, you can do, you can practice that on the road in a much more subtle way. I mean, you don't need to hang off on the road. I think I've said before, you know, through left and right corners, you're basically pivoting from one bum cheek to the neck, to the other bum cheek, not 
actually hanging off and you can shuffle your feet back and forward. So the inside foot has got its toes on, on the pegs. The outside foot can be flat footed. Your inside foot could even be flat footed as well if you turn your toe in, which is what I do a lot, especially if there's bikes with, that are cramped and I can't get my toe on the peg. Um, and then just, just lean forward a little bit on the road when you get to a corner and then it will bend your, it'll bend your arm. And if you drop your shoulder into the corner and bend your arm, you know, it's like doing a ski slalom or if you, if you, if you ran through some cones, you'd be, and it's the same, it's the same with a bike. So, uh, give that, um, give that bent arm a go. And I reckon you'll have your left hand as, as good as your right. <clears throat> And thank you very much for your question. Very interesting. And it's something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, okay, next one is from uh, Brad P26. Uh, love the videos, Michael. Thank you. I'm 30 and starting to get into sports bikes. I love hearing you talk about motorcycle racing and wondered if I'm too old now to ever have a go at amateur motorcycle racing at some point in the future. Well, 30? You're young. Wow. You're nearly half my age. Um, no, it's never too late to start racing. Kind of, I, I raced when I was young. I raced when I was 18 till 24, and then had to stop for a long, long time because of injury. Um, but I started again in, when I joined MCN. I started racing all just after, in 2005, when I was 35. I did a few races on my GSXR 1000K5 long-term test bike. I did a few little, um, I did a thunder sprint in uh, Northwich and I did a an endurance race, KRC endurance race at Donington with Crescent Suzuki with a full team on a GSX-R600 with um, Trevor Franklin and Mark Potter, which was really good. That, that kind of got me um, interested in racing again. And from 2006 to now, I've been racing pretty much full on the whole time, you know, and doing some amazing things. Um, so yeah, so 35 really is when I was kind of a born again racer and I don't think that was uh, too late. You know, in my early 40s, I was riding faster than I've ever been in my life and all the way through probably to close to 50 when COVID came and the momentum's kind of stopped for me a little bit. So I don't think age is a barrier. You know, it's such a great thing to see when you're classic racing, you know, I've done um, Phillip Island Classic, I've done Goodwood Revival. And when you see these old guys who are old enough to know better in their black leathers racing around on their bikes, they've all got a glint in their eye. You know, they're not sitting around watching EastEnders every night. They're out there doing it, they're racing. And I think it keeps you young, it keeps you fit, it keeps you happy. Um, you know, it's not for everyone racing and a lot of people get their kicks out of just riding. And I'm, I'm guessing that's you if you're watching this video. So you'll know what I'm talking about. You know, just just riding around the block is a pleasure. And, you know, that that feeling just gets kind of amplified exponentially when when you're racing. You know, there's nothing like the adrenaline of start in a race. There's nothing like the relief of finishing the race. <laughs> And everything that happens in between is just a, it's just a, a haze of magnificence. <laughs> um, and if you do well, that's even better, isn't it? So, yeah, I think if you start racing, you know, start on something small. That's relatively cheap. No racing's cheap. Um, something that's not going to eat tyres. Something that's not going to need a lot of upkeep. Something like an SV650 maybe, or a TZR250, or... Uh, MZ, CB500, something like that. And then if you like it, um, yeah, you can you can progress from there. And clubs like Bemsey are really kind of uh, new rider friendly as well. So I'd recommend going to race with them if you're in the UK. Um, you know, racing, starting racing is going to make your skin. <laughs> it's going to ruin your social life and it will be all you can think of. But I think if you've got the itch, you should definitely scratch it. So uh, yeah, let me know how you get on. Thanks very much for the question. Next, right, this is from user uh, one IZ6LZATC2R. Are cafe racer seating position more comfortable than the standard seating position? 
I'm not really comfortable on long days on the road and windshields make the front wobbly and unstable. Should I try something like a VIP pillin? You're really knowledgeable. Thank you for sharing all that information. Thank you very much for your question. <clears throat> I didn't understand that the first time around, but I've contacted you, haven't I? And uh, you've elaborated. You're a new rider and you've got an MT-07. So first of all, great bike as a, your first big bike. An MT-07 is just brilliant in terms of you know, the engine, the fun, the practicality, how easy it is to ride. Um, but I would agree with you that um, on it hasn't got very good wind protection. So if you go down the motorways, you're going to get blown around by the wind. Um, I don't think a VIP pillin is the answer because basically all naked bikes have the same problem, whether it's an MT-07 or an MT-10 or a Street Fighter or whatever. The lack of fairing... Um, makes high speed riding difficult you know anything over 85 90 you're going to start really feeling it and any speeds above that are the kind of speeds you only visit once or twice um in your riding life with that bike really just so you can kind of feel it on track of course um but it's not very comfortable hanging on uh, high speed on a naked bike but that's why naked bikes are fun that's why you get more of an impression of speed because you've got the uh, the wind through your um, metaphorical hair, um, and yeah, you get you get a big sensation of speed, a sensation of speed that you wouldn't on a like a super bike, which is designed to just slice through the wind silently, and you don't really feel the speed as like you do on a naked bike. Um, you also mentioned that fitting a screen to a naked bike makes it wobbly, which I'd I'd agree. You know, if you put a screen on a bike that's um, connected to the handlebars that moves with the bars, when you get wind buffeting, it is going to shake the bars a little bit. Never dangerously, but if you don't like that feeling, then then that's going to happen. You could go completely the other way and get a bike with a massive screen. You know, tall rotors, something like a Tracer 700 or a Triumph Tiger Sport 660 or a little adventure bike, something like that. But the problem with those is that the screens on those are really noisy and really, really loud, especially if you're going into a headwind. It can completely spoil the bike. It does for me anyway. Um, so the answer really is to get a bike that slices through the wind nice and quietly. And, and those kind of bikes are sporty bikes and sports touring style bikes. So for the kind of size bike that you're looking at, you know, the fared version of yours, which is an R7, that's really nice on the motorway. You know, you hardly get any wind noise and, or wind buffeting. You've got things like the CBR 650R and the CBR 500R. They're really nice through the wind. The Aprilia RS 660, things like that. So, um, yeah, if you're going to change bikes and you're worried about the wind noise and the wind protection, um, go down that road. But, you know, you know, unless you're going to do any big trips, if you just kind of you know, pottering around on the bike, doing short journeys, I'd keep it as a naked, you know, it keeps your speed down as well because you've got such a big impression of speed. I'd keep your MT-07, but um, yeah, that's a very, very good question. So thanks for sending it in. Next, <clears throat> bits and bobs. Thanks for your question. Uh, Neasy, this is the most, best motorbike content on YouTube. Ooh, thank you. What's the best non-V4 or V2 Ducati? All the best. So I actually answered this for you. I asked the question, what did you mean by non-V4 or non-V2? Because they're all V4s or V2s, but you mean the um, the current sports bikes. So um, what is the best Ducati sports bike of the past, I suppose? Well, <clears throat> in terms of dynamics, in terms of how refined and easy these Ducatis are to ride. The, the modern ones are the best. So, you know, you jump on a Panigale V4S or V4R, um, Street Fighter, Multistrada, the way they're mapped, so cleverly mapped, the bikes are really, really smooth. That's before you even bump into any rider aids. You've got lovely quick shifters. They're really, really refined. So you kind of got, you know, you've got the beauty and the power and the the engine noise and all the drama wrapped up in a package that's really easy to use. If you start to go back through the Panigale range, back to its 2012 1199 launch, they get steadily angrier as you go back. 
Um, you've got the 1098, 1198, which are good bikes. They were kind of, even Dominicali says, they were launched as stop gaps between the 999 and then bringing out the Panigale. So they were great bikes. They were very, very talky. They used to sort of tie themselves up in knots, um, a little bit soft at the back, but nice. But nice. 999s were dynamically really good bikes, especially the, the later S models and the, and the R, even though the looks weren't to everyone's taste at the time. I think they've they've come of age. I think the 999s are really good. The 916 series of bikes up to 998, you know, what hasn't been said about those, the way they look, the fact those engines aren't kind of silenced by Euro 5, deadening, you know, they sound like, bombs going off those old Ducatis, even the 748s, so they set car alarms off. So they're amazing. But for me, I think if I was to have a, a Ducati superbike in the garage and one I could just enjoy on a Sunday morning and ride slowly to enjoy it, I'd have an 888 or an 851 or in, any one of those shaped bikes. I just think they're just, they're just beautiful. They're light, they sound incredible. I mean, by today's standards, the performance would probably be quite disappointing, but they are just, you know, like all of us, when you see certain bikes when you're young, they just they just stick with you. And, you know, seeing those 888s, a friend of mine had one when I was 18 or 19, and I was just in love with it from there on in. So, um, yeah, I suppose what would be kind of a, a pick of an affordable Ducati a nice 1098 or a nice 999. I think that would be a really nice kind of nice riding experience. Not too expensive. But obviously, you've got servicing costs on those old ones with the belts and stuff like that. So not the cheapest to run. But thanks very much for the question. Very interesting. Right. Paddock Whack 999. I'm always surprised that you overlooked the ZH2 when talking about Super Nakeds. Having owned a, having owned a 1290 Super Duke followed by a Toronto V4... Now the ZH2, I found the perfect compromise between all-day comfort, decent handling, and outright acceleration, especially when the ECU's flashed. So yeah, thanks for the question. That's a, that's a really good point, actually. So I'm actually running a H2 SX as a long-term test bike this year, which is the fared version of the, the ZH2. And the overriding thing about that is just how smooth that engine is and how smooth the ride quality is, which is actually helped by the fact they're, they're quite heavy. They're not the lightest bikes in the world. Um, we rode the ZH2 at its launch in 2020 in Las Vegas um, on the NASCAR track, going around the, the, the speed bowl, which is just incredible, <clears throat> and around the handling circuit. Um, I'd actually broken my hand two weeks before, so that wasn't so incredible, but it was still a lovely bike. Um, the the fact that it kind of sits in a class of its own though really it's kind of a hyper naked in the same vein as a, a diavel v4 or a rocket 3 something like that quirky kind of naked when it first came out we put it in with other super nakeds and because it's kind of so heavy it, it never did very well it didn't do very well against you know the tuonos of the world and the super dukes of the world and the street fighters around the track. Straight line performance wasn't quite as good as the others, especially under braking. Um, and at the beginning, it didn't do too well. We've since thought that it's a little bit unfair to put it up against Super Nakeds, which is why we don't include that in those group tests, which would, which you'd think um, we're overlooking that bike, but we're not overlooking that bike. There's just not too many chances to test it, really. We did test it this year in MCN against the, the Ducati and the uh, Triumph. So have a look at that test to see how it did. But yes, yeah, a really, really great bike that you can't really pigeonhole, which is, I guess, one of the appeals about it. So thanks very much for your question. Right, <clears throat> Trio 80, um, thanks for your question. Excellent advice on low gear, high revs through corners being the safer way to ride on track. I will certainly take that to heart. And I suppose it's just as valid for Supermoto, which I've just taken up. Right, this is interesting. So this is um, this is kind of a track riding technique. 
that through corners, you want to be keeping the revs high, which basically means going through corners a gear lower than you perhaps think you should around track. So, and it's probably one of the things you talk about most when I was doing the Ron Haston race school. Um, one of the things that road riders kind of have to adapt to because when you're riding on the road, you, you want to be smooth, you want to be fluid, you want to flow along. And generally you're in quite high gears at low revs, using the, the torque of the bike and the low end power. You, you're very rarely screaming the bike. And that, that will make things nice and smooth and you know, you're having a lovely day when that's happening. If you do that on track, you can get round okay to a certain point but you'll start to run into a point where it starts to become a little bit dangerous. As you go faster and faster with more and more lean, when you're starting to dance on the edge of grip, being low revs in the middle of the corner can be dangerous because if the tire spins, which is kind of quite likely to because you're sort of approaching the meat of the torque of your engine, which is the thing that spins tires. Um, if it spins, then number one, it's gonna it's gonna really spin. It's gonna the revs are gonna shoot all the way through the revs around the clock till it hits the the red line. In which time it's span right up, and then as soon as it hits the red line or you shut off, it's gonna just high side you to the moon. The other thing um, with that is that when you're in a lazy gear, you haven't got a very direct throttle connection. So if you think when you're riding along on the road in sixth gear, you can almost do what you want with the throttle and it's not really going to change the acceleration much. Whereas if you're in first, a, a, a millimetre is going to go, poof, you're going to fly. Um, so when you're in that scenario in a high gear on track and if it slides, when you come off the throttle, nothing really happens. The, the wheel keeps on spinning. So if you go through the corner in a gear higher or gear lower with the revs higher, two things are going to happen. Number one is less likely to spin in the first place because you're kind of going past the engine's peak torque. Um, if it does spin up, then there's not many revs left to go till it hits the red line. So you kind of got your own inbuilt traction control there um, and you've got better throttle connection. So if it does start to move, then the second you shut off, it will come back straight away. There's no satellite delay. So you've got a much better throttle connection and it's much less likely to slide. So they're the, the safety aspects of that technique. And then um, it's gonna give you better performance around the track. So coming out onto the straight in a gear lower, as long as it's not so low that you're running out of gear before the edge of the, the track on the exit. <clears throat> coming out in that lower gear, you're gonna accelerate down the straights faster than you would have done in a lazy gear. Uh, and then going into the corner, you've got extra engine braking as well, which you don't have with a lazy gear. So it's win, 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 win. The only negatives of that approach are number one, you're gonna need slightly more refined um, throttle, uh, skill on the throttle, um, which with a nice smoothly mapped bike, is easy but if you've got like a fuel injected bike that's a bit jerky that can be a bit jerky and um, you'll soon get used to that um, and it sounds violent you know if you're just used to rolling around and never screaming the engine when you start to scream the engine of a super bike or a super sport bikes it takes some getting used to it, it feels like you're hurting the bike doesn't it it feels aggressive and it feels violent but once you've overcome that and got used to that new technique it would be very hard to go back. The bike would feel really lazy and unresponsive and uncontrollable if you went back to the old lazy rev technique. Um, <clears throat> as for the Supermoto, number one, well done getting a Supermoto. Uh, they, they're great fun. So that just proves Supermotos aren't quite dead yet. Um, but that technique doesn't work as well on a Supermoto because they're big singles. And because they don't really, they've got a very small rev range anyway, you're not going to have such a problem. So, you know, my advice on a supermoto would, would really be to use the gear that feels the most natural. Whereas on a, a four cylinder, for example, you could, you've got a choice of gears in corners. With a supermoto, you're kind of stuck with the gear that's not going to clatter too much coming out on the with two lower revs, and a gear that's not going to run out of revs too quickly 
between the apex and the exit curb. So, you know, you can't really use that technique in Supermoto, but the whole thing's a little bit sportier and more direct anyway, isn't it? So anyway, let me know how you get on. Thanks very much for your question. Next, Ian Hoyle. <clears throat> Hello, Michael. Hello, Ian. Thanks for your question. I had no idea you'd won your opportunity with MCN. That's awesome. And I imagine there was more to it than just luck. No, definitely luck. Right place at the right time. Um, Ramsgate to Peterborough must have been quite a culture shock. You maybe still miss the sea. I do. Um, or not, although not the seagulls and their, um, their toilet habits. But I've got Rutland Water now just down the road, which is kind of my sea replacement, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm the same age as you, but not so adept at looking after myself. So I wanted to ask how you stay in shape fitness to keep enjoy riding sports bikes effectively. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I suppose it's just, you know, general keep fit, bit of running, bit of cycling, bit of watching what I eat, bit of using some um, diet apps. 2011, I lost three stone using my fitness pal. Um, which basically encourages you not to snack <laughs> or overeat and uh, the weight just dropped off you know along with a load of other exercise as well and I was I, I got a bit porky then <clears throat> to the point where I got a few comments online and it kind of upset me at the time but um, ultimately made me lose weight and I've kept kept around about the same weight ever since so you know between 11 and 12 generally depending on the time of year <laughs> Um but yeah, there's always that kind of thing looking over me that I know that at some point, you know, within the next few days or few weeks or month or whatever, I'm going to be putting a set of leathers on and going on a track, which is a really, really nice thing to have. So, you know, because that's always in my ear, you know, be careful what you eat. Don't do it. Don't be silly. Um, I managed to keep a lid on it. I think if I never rode a sports bike again and I never had to put a set of leathers on again, I might take my foot off the gas a little bit and um, half pull the ripcord but <laughs> until then. But anyway, you know, I enjoy keeping fit. It, it gives you a little, um, a little zhuzh, doesn't it? A little buzz. But yeah, thanks very much for your question. Much appreciated. Um, Mark Mallet 922 asks, thank you for your question. Hello, Neasy. What's your opinion on braking? tires, brakes, engine, etc. Being a road tester, I think that you need data quickly and do not have any opportunity to bed in pads, scuff the tires, etc. Thanks again for the wonderful insight you have on motorcycles. Thank you very much. Um, braking in tires, engine and pads. So engines, generally when we get um, bikes to test from uh, manufacturer press fleets, they're, they're generally run in, so you don't have to worry about that too much. Sometimes with long-term test bikes, we get them with zero miles on the clock. So we've got to do the running, running in miles and then get the first service done and then we can get going. Um, but I think it's just as long as you're careful with the engine, as long as you don't labour it or thrash it, which you kind of wouldn't do in normal riding anyway, um, I don't think you've got too much of a problem. You know, I see a lot of manufacturers' bikes when we get them when they've been run in, I've only got a few hundred miles on the clock anyway. And then we then we thrash the, the hell out of them. So I just think it's just common sense, really. You know, just ride normally on the road. I mean, there's not many places on the road you can absolutely cane a big bike anyway, is there? And you wouldn't be labouring an engine if you, you know, if you know what you're doing anyway. So, so the engines, yep, yeah, okay, brake pads. I think it's just a question of just like everything in bikes it's always a, a a slow gradual build up it's it's never sort of going in with all guns blazing so with brake pads you know with new brake pads brake gently maybe ride along slowly and just drag the brake a little bit just to get a little bit of uh, the glaze off the pads and and just build up you know don't go into the first round about full tilt with new brake pads because they probably won't work um and the same goes with tires um, you know, as long as you can get the shiny bit off, it's not a question of the miles you do, it's a question of the, the times you lean over. So if you can do a ride where you're just gradually leaning over a little bit more, once the shiny uh, coating comes off the tyres, they're scrubbed in. After that, you've just got to make sure they're warm, obviously. 
you know, don't get the shine off and then just go because the tire might be cold. So, you know, get the shiny bit off and then make sure the tire's warm. Um, you know, when I'm racing, I suppose that's the time where you need to scrub pads and, and tires in double quick. And generally it only takes a lap to do one's each side of the tire. So if, if you're somewhere like Brands Hatch, you know, on the warm up lap, you can scrub a set of, set, um, a set of tires in. You can do all the rights. You probably can't do the lefts immediately. Maybe that'll take two more laps. And you could probably scrub in a set of brake pads in a couple of laps just by going gentle and building up. Another little thing, um, you know, when I'm racing to help scrub tires in is to adopt a little trick we use during photo shoots um, to help you lean a bike over more. So when we're doing photo shoots, the idea is to look good in pictures and not be fast. So it's a really good trick to go through the corners a gear or two higher when the revs are really low and lazy, the complete opposite to what I was saying earlier to actually do it properly. And then when you've got kind of lazy gears, the bike just flops over more. When you've got a, a low gear, the bike wants to sit upright. So for pictures, we just go through corners like so you can get lots of lean. And the same goes when I'm scrubbing tires in on the track. You know, just take really wide lines instead of the correct V lines. Go through the, gear, the corners of gear too high so you can lean it right over each side and then you're kind of you're kind of good to go. Um, but yeah, it doesn't take long to, to scrub in modern tires and brakes. You just kind of got to be careful and build up. Once you've got the shine off the brake pads, they're good to go. Once you've got the shine off the tires, they're good to go. Just warm everything up. Um, thanks very much for your question. Right, next one, Paul King. Still fit in my Zach Mater measures. Got them in 98, I remember them. Uh, right, thanks for your question. Considering that a large portion of the biking demographic are like us, relics from the era of the sports bike hoons, do you see sports and hyper tours like the Booster ZZR 1400 making a comeback in numbers? We all fit in them better. We have nothing to prove anymore. And the adventure thing is starting to look a bit stale on the big pretend adventure bikes. Well, good question. <clears throat> yeah, if you're of a certain age, um, you probably won't like sports bikes or be as into them as you used to be. It's one of the reasons they don't sell anymore is because they're, they're quite uncompromising to say the least. And it's exactly why adventure bikes are so popular. So I suppose people like, you know, us have evolved from sports bikes, maybe gone to super nakeds and a lot of people now ride adventure bikes. Not necessarily because they go off road, but they do. But it's just because of the, the comfort. I had a Tiger 1200 GT Explorer last year and it's one of the most comfortable bikes I've ever ridden. It was like a like a revelation, like a second coming that I could do all these miles without being in pain. It was amazing. And it had good performance, it handled well, the brakes were superb, had all the electronics you'd ever need, including the electronics to make life more comfortable with uh, uh, the heated seats and cruise control and all that kind of stuff. You can even get sporty tyres for bikes like these now. So the dual purpose tyres now that are kind of more road orientated are really good. People like Dunlop and Metzler make sports tyres for 19 inch front wheels uh, with the Metzler M9 uh, Sport Tech RR and the Sport Smart, Sport Smart TT. So you can have an adventure bike that absolutely corners properly. <clears throat> okay, adventure bikes aren't pretty. They're rugged, you know, in their own way. But you know, opening the door to a Triumph Tiger isn't the same as opening a garage door to a Panigale, that's for sure. I think for that reason, the reason they're so comfortable are the, is the reason adventure bikes and, and tall rounders are here to stay really, unless suddenly the biking demographic gets a lot, lot younger and you get a whole new kind of raft of people that were like we were when we were in our 20s and 30s, which I don't see happening, unfortunately. As for kind of more traditional big sports tours like the Booster and ZZR, of course, Suzuki still make the Suzuki. I don't know how well it, it does. But these bikes are really expensive now. They're not kind of affordable machines like they used to be in the 90s and the noughties. You know, these are big money now. So, you know, there might be another reason why the appetite to actually produce them isn't there. But if you, um, if you look around, there's still quite a lot of conventional kind of sporty touring bikes. You've got the H2SX, of course. 
I mean, that's not cheap. <laughs> 27 grand, the one I'm running is. Um, you've got uh, Suzuki, God bless them. We've got the GS6S 1000 GT, which is a sports tour, which is good fun. You've got the Ninja 1000 SX and the Z1000 SX as it was before. You've got the Moto Guzzi Mandelo, which is a really, really good bike. So, you know, scratch at the surface and you'll find the odd sports tourer. But I think generally, you know, the way things are going now, it's more, it's more upright bikes. And well, maybe it will go the kind of comfortable sports bike route. I think we're all hoping Yamaha are gonna make an R9. That might be the answer to all of our prayers, if it's any good. But no, great question. And um, I'm glad you're still fitting your leathers. Very cool. <laughs> right, next, two more. This is from Gambo916. Hi Anivesy, really enjoying your YouTube content, content, especially these Q&A vids and the ones about your K67 race bike. Well yeah, the K67 is a BMW S1000RR, that's the code name for it. Um, <clears throat> a question please, if you could ride any bike, uh, whatever, road or race, past or present that you haven't already ridden, which one would it be? For me it would be Spencer's NS500 triple, but I'm curious to know which one bike you uh, most yearn to have a go on. Cheers, dude. Thanks, mate. Well, just before I answer this question, I've noticed another question you've put in there, which uh, maybe I'll answer one day. I don't really know how to answer it, to be honest, but you talk about how nice it would be to um, spend a day being a road tester on a launch where you get flown to an exotic location, get to ride one of the world's best bikes, burn through their tires, um, I'm kind of with you up until there, and then you talk about being wined and dined, um, being plied with alcohol, meeting the local ladies of the wherever you are, etc., etc. So, <laughs> um, I think you've got the wrong idea about how launches are. Um, but yeah, in, in, a, in an ideal world, they'd be like that, wouldn't they? But you know, they say there's no such thing as a free lunch, so uh, that's all I say about that. Um, but coming back onto your question, I'm kind of, I'm with you along the same lines, really. You're, you're gonna go for Spencer's NS500 triple, and I'm probably gonna go for a Duan um, NSR500. Whether it would be one of the early screamers or one of the later Big Bangs, I just think, you know, that kind of epitomizes the, the age of the superheroes, as Matt Oxley kind of coined it, of the, you know, the Schwantz and Rainey and Doohan and Lawson and Gardner days when they rode these animals. And, you know, people like Oxley and my old boss, Mark Potter, got to ride these bikes, which is just unbelievable. I'd love to have a go. You know, I've got close. I've ridden four cylinder 500s before. I've ridden um, Randy Mamola's uh, Kajiva 500 at the Saxon Ring. I actually raced it there in a, I say race, like a demo race, GP Legends um, event, and that was cool, although the bike wasn't running quite right. Um, I rode there on a ZX-10 actually, which is cool. I've ridden uh, Bruce Anstey's YZR500 at Mallory, which was really good. We just had a lunch time to ride it. But our photographer at the time was hell-bent on covering the bike with GoPros, and not only did it take ages to do and get into our riding time, the bike looked like a porcupine in the pictures. <laughs> so I only got a couple of laps, but that was fantastic. But the thing I noticed most about that coming down the straight is that it felt slow. You know, compared to a superbike, they haven't got the power of a modern superbike. So it felt slow down the straights, but incredibly light everywhere else. And you know, that's where the, the secret to riding those fast is, isn't it? Is to, is to is the way you maximize the corner speed and the power and all the rest of it. And I got a proper bit of um, YZR500 experience on a, a Paget, another Paget Yamaha, an ex John Reynolds one, which I guess had a Harris chassis, um, which was also used at the TT at some point around Cadwell. We had Cadwell to ourselves all afternoon and Clive, bless him, he's such a generous person, let me ride this 500 around the track all afternoon, which was just amazing. I kept feeling like I had to come in because you normally only get a handful of laps on these things. He said, no, no, go out. You know, later on, he's let us, he let us ride Anstey's RCV around Cadwell as well. So amazing. Anyway, um, I, did, I did the Cadwell crash almost coming round the track, get to the gooseneck, going through the right, 
and then coming through the left, by that time your tyres are cold and uh, a lot of people high side or low side out of there. I high sided, the bike chucked me up in the air but luckily I landed back on the seat. Went off the track nearly to the rumble strip and then back in again and after that I thought okay, I'll leave that there. <laughs> But yeah, that absolutely that could have been a bad day. That could have been a bad day. But as it was, it was um, it gave me the the full five hundred experience. But um, thanks very much for your question. Maybe I'll answer the uh, the dream day in a, in life of a road tester one soon as well. And you can find that question on the comments on one of the videos. And finally, if you're still with us, um, is a question from uh, Vili, Vil Arias, Aras. 5371. Any thoughts on the Panigale V2 tank and seat? I want to love the bike but hate the tank. It's low and very slope forward. It offers no support. Being 196 centimetres tall doesn't help either. Any tips on how to fix the tank issue? <clears throat> well, I know what you mean. Um, the V2 Panigale is very, very slim. You know, it's only one piston wide, isn't it? Because it's a V twin like that. Um, and hanging on under braking is, is very difficult. There's not a lot to grip onto. Um, but there are two, two ways you can alleviate the problem. There's nothing you can do to alter the tank shape um, or do anything with the seat really. The only things you can do with seats are make them bulkier, which would sit you even higher up, which would make it worse. But you can fit um, things like stomp grips on the tank which are those stick on plastic things with kind of textured surface so you can you can um, dig your knees into it under hard braking <clears throat> so you can squeeze your knees into the tank and you can hold yourself up under braking but there's an even more effective way than that um, which will allow you to hang on under braking and it will also allow you to have floppy arms as you brake in so you're not absolutely arm straight and that is to hang off slightly when you're braking. So, you know, this works really, really well on track. Um, not so much on the road, but you're not braking that hard. You need to hang on on the road, I wouldn't imagine. Maybe you are. But um, <clears throat> so the technique is to, well, let me, let me start the, the process off. So when you've got a corner approaching, um, you want to be hanging off before the corner, before you even brake because that's the easiest time to get into a body position when there's no big stresses on the bike. Um, and you don't want to be hanging off close to the corner because you're going to unsettle the bike and you're braking and you're doing loads of other stuff. So say if I was going along the straight and I had a, a left-hander coming up, way before the braking zone, I get the bottom half of my body into my cornering position. So that means hanging your bum off, so you've got one whole cheek off the seat, um, and getting your, your foot into position, I mean, that's not as crucial because you need to be um, braking and, and, and changing gears anyway. But that bum position is really important. And you can leave the rest of your body inside the bike. You can still be tucked in under the, the screen. You can still have your arms in. Um, but when it comes uh, to time to brake, all you have to do then is, is lift up and then you brake, 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 let go of the brake, and then you just throw your top half of your body off and you're in the right position. You're already in that bottom half riding position and all you have to do is move your body. And that works all around the track. So generally at most tracks, you're never sat in the middle of the bike. You're always hanging off one way or the other, anticipate in the next corner. What that technique also allows you to do, because you're hanging your bottom half of your body off just before you brake, is that you can hold yourself up with your inside thigh on the front of the fuel tank. So rather than gripping your knees in the fuel tank and using your knee strength and your groin and your hands to hold you up, what you're doing now is holding yourself up with, if you're going around the left, your inside right thigh. And if you complement that with gripping on with your left thigh and also digging your heels into the, the foot peg, um, the foot peg, heel plates and um, that's going to lock you in and that's going to help you hang on under braking and if you've got a set of stomp pads as well that that takes it a step further and that will allow you to hang on under hard braking even on a, a thin bike like a, a Panigale 
and also it's less stress on your arms. The bike's going to do what you want because you're in the right body position. One less thing to think about hanging off back there instead of in the braking zone. It's just win, 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 win. So, so yeah, there is a fix. It's not to actually change anything on the bike. It's just really to, to change where you sit when you brake. You can do it a little bit on the road, you know, but you're not really hanging your bum off on the road. Um, but you, you, maybe you could a little bit, just, you know, if you really were braking hard and you're struggling to hold on, but um, yeah, that's definitely the, the track technique. So where are we? We're finished. Thank you very much for your, your patience and, and sitting tight to the end for those of you that have. Thank you very much for watching. Keep sending in those questions. And we'll see you soon.